just joining us, welcome to Emergency Medicine Prime Time. Yes, it has been an action-packed afternoon filled with rupturing aortas, breaking bones, and a paronychia. Yes, that was an explosive paronychia, Deethi. In fact, that's a pretty funny word. Turns out that it comes from the I ancient... I believe we're at the end of our first shift, when the outgoing team will conduct a critically important handoff. And let me just emphasize that word critical for you folks. A lot of errors can occur as a result of a poor handoff. In fact, there was one time when... I couldn't agree more. Let's go now to our sideline reporter waiting at the scene. What do you have for us, Drew? Thank you, Aditi. There's been a lot of activity and complexity today, so this should be real interesting. Could be one of the more challenging handouts we've seen today. I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, you ready to sign out? All right, let's do this. All right, let's start with Mr. A. He's a 25-year-old male. He's presenting with abdominal pain that started last night. Initially, it was diffuse, a 3 out of 10. Then it moved kind of to his right lower quadrant, 5 out of 10. Now it's a 7 out of 10. Uh, he's pretty tender in the right lower quadrant. Uh, CT scan confirms appendicitis. He has an elevated white blood cell count. He has a fever. I've covered him with empiric antibiotics. I consulted surgery. I think they're going to take him to the OR. All right, so nothing for me to do? Yeah, nothing to do. Right. Mrs. B is an 85-year-old female. She has a history of dementia, diabetes, frequent UTI. She's coming from a skilled nursing facility. Uh, staff found her more lethargic this morning. The urine looks dirty. She's got a lactate of 5. Initial blood pressure was 75 over 55. I gave her a liter of fluids. Her systolic came up to 85. Uh, I called the ICU. They don't have a bed right now, uh, but they said they're going to make one. Wait, so this... Uh... And then Miss C, she's a 28-year-old female. She's coming in with three days of right lower quadrant pain. It's been going on for about three days. I did a pelvic uh, exam on her. No sign of PID, but she's very tender in that right lower quadrant. I couldn't really feel the, uh, the ovary on exam, so I ordered a pelvic ultrasound to further clarify what's going on. Uh, not really sure on her. So what should I do if the ultrasound's negative? No, I'm not sure, but I trust you. All right. Okay, I think that's enough excitement for now. Let me turn it back to you, Aditi. Thank you, Drew. That was a little painful. Yeah, it was. Kind of like a paronychia. Okay, for additional review and insight, let's go to our handoff analyst. Dr. Gordon, help us understand what we just saw. Thank you, Aditi. It's great to be here. I'm David Gordon. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Tom Morsey. And Tom, I don't know about you, but I think we got a lot to talk about. Oh boy, do we ever. Uh, where do we start? Well, transitions of care, which are also called patient handoffs, are an issue of national medical importance because breakdowns in communication have been shown to be a leading cause of medical error. In the emergency department, transitions occur when patients are admitted or discharged, but what Tom and I want to talk about today are the handoffs that occur at change of shift. What can we do to maximize the safety and effectiveness of handoffs that occur between ED providers? Yeah, this is a big point. It seems to me there's two basic tenets you have to keep in mind when you're trying to go into a change of shift patient care handoff. The first one, and I know how tough this is in a bustling emergency department, is to set yourself up with an environment that's conducive for a good handoff. You wanna try and find a quieter corner and minimize interruptions. Sometimes this means you have to partner with your nurses in the last hour of the shift to tie up loose ends or maybe address issues they have so they won't have to bother you during the transition of care. The second one, and I can't tell you how vital this is, it's so important to have a structured process for information transfer that both you and your receiver are comfortable with. Now there's lots of good models out there, including SBAR and handoffs and mnemonics. One that I've been using recently that I like, and I've heard you talk about, and I know you like, aptly named IPASS technique. Yes, absolutely, Tom. So the IPASS, when studied in the context of inpatient pediatrics, was part of a handoff bundle that actually reduced medical errors. Wow. Yeah. Now there's a lot of interest in studying and adapting the IPASS for its use in emergency medicine. So Tom, let's go through the mnemonic. Yeah, let's break this down a little bit. It starts off with I. That's for illness severity. This is your chance to grab your listener's attention, to let them know how sick this patient is, to put their brain in the frame that you think it needs to be in to receive this information. Is this a really critical, unstable patient? Do I need your undivided attention right now? Or is this somebody who's been worked up, dispositioned, and all I really need is for you to get the gist of my presentation? And what about those guys in the middle? They're the ones that worry me the most. Frequently, we'll use the term watcher for these guys. Watch that guy in seven. He's admitted to the floor for pneumonia, and he looks okay, but it wouldn't surprise me to see him crump on your shift. Makes a lot of sense, Tom. And that brings us to P, which stands for patient summary. 
Now, being able to summarize your patients is important in order to minimize the already high cognitive load carried by emergency physicians. In your summary, you want to be able to describe what brought the patient in, what has occurred so far, and what are the next steps. Now, in deciding how brief or detailed your summary is going to be, you need to consider several important factors. Does your patient already have a defined illness, or are they still actively being worked up? Has their disposition already been established, or is it still being determined? And thirdly, what are the chances that your patient is going to have a change in their clinical status or course? Now, if your patient already has a diagnosis, you can start with that and forego the minutia that may have been relevant in the beginning, but now is not going to shed any more light into your patient's condition. In general, if your patient has a disposition and are unlikely to have a change in their clinical course, your summary can be very brief. However, if your patient is undefined, is unstable, or is at risk of becoming unstable, then you need your summary to be more detailed because your colleague will need information to respond to an evolving clinical situation. Right, absolutely. And once you've got this summary, then you can move on to the real meat of the case presentation, the A, the action plan. Essentially, this is a to-do list for the receiving team. Now, they're going to be getting a lot of information, and it's coming at them fast, so you've got to keep this short and to the point. What do I need you to do? When do I need you to do it? Maybe it's some pending laboratory data, a troponin that you need to check. Perhaps we're waiting for a consultant to come down and give us some advice on a particularly tricky patient. One thing I run into a lot is, I'll start treatment on a patient based on my provisional diagnosis, but I'm not 100% sure I'm right, so I really need my receiving team to check back up on that patient, make sure they're responding like I would expect them to, kind of reality check me. Sometimes it's as simple as, there's nothing to do, and it's fair to say that too. Absolutely. Now this brings us to the first S of the IPASS mnemonic, situational awareness and contingency planning. So situational awareness allows the team to understand what may be going on at the institutional or individual level. Is the hospital full? Is the consultant tied up in the operating room? Is there still family that's on their way? At the individual level, does the patient have any individual concerns or needs that need to be met? For example, your patient might be worried that they have cancer. Contingency planning allows the team to anticipate any future problems and how to address them. It's typically worded in the form of if-then statements. And this brings us to the second S, the synthesis or the summary. This is where the receiving team has grabbed the ball and this is their chance to run with it. I ask them to summarize what I just said so that I can be sure that my points got through to them. This is also a great opportunity for them to ask questions or clarify things that might not have been crystal clear about the patient. Questions and clarifications should probably be best done at the, at the end of each case presentation. The final summary, you can do that after each case presentation or often in the emergency room, we'll do that after running the entire board. In fact, when it's really busy, I like to do both. I think you and I have a lot in common, Tom. So that's the IPASS model. We got one more thing before to take it home. We talked about the importance of setup. We talked about the importance of structured communication using the IPASS as a model. Now we have one more thing to talk about, which is seeing the patient. Now, in many institutions, the handoff actually occurs within a physician workspace, not at the bedside. But as you go through your roster of patients, think about those where it would be particularly important to see together. This is particularly true of patients who are unstable, and you also want to consider a patients who have exam findings that would be important to confirm together, such as the case with abdominal tenderness, altered mental status, or focal neurologic deficits. So there you go. Tom, I think we covered a lot. Did we leave anything out? I don't think so. I mean, you know us, we could go on all day about this, but I think it's probably time we put this puppy to bed. There you have it, back to you all. That was absolutely fantastic. Great stuff, gentlemen. You know what else is great? There's this one time when I was an intern. So we've just received word that there's more action back on the field. Drew, tell us what's going on. Well, Aditi, the chef is mad and the kitchen is hot. Coach was pretty upset with his starters and sat him on the bench. He sent the second team out to get this right. Let's see if they've got it. I'll just give him what he needs and get it right here. Okay, so Mr. A is currently stable. He's a 25-year-old male with a CT-confirmed appendicitis admitted to surgery. So far, he's gotten IV fluids, antibiotics, and the OR should be calling for him within an hour. He may need some more pain medication, but so far he's been well controlled with morphine. Now, if the OR doesn't call for him within an hour, then page surgery. Got it. So Mr. A has appendicitis and he's going to the OR. What's next? So Mrs. S, she's currently the sickest patient in the department and she's currently unstable and she's a full code. She's an 85 year old female with a history of dementia, diabetes coming in from the nursing home with urosepsis. Uh, staff there today noticed that she was more lethargic than usual. 
Here she's febrile, tachycardic, hypotensive, and arousable to gentle stimuli, which is a change from her baseline. Her white blood cell count's elevated, her lactate's five, and her urine's floridly positive. Uh, I've given her antibiotics and initiated the first fluid bolus. So please reassess her lactate and her blood pressure after she's gotten the fluids. You're also gonna have to call the admitting ICU team to give them report. And while she's down here, keep checking on her mental status because she's really worrying me. Now the ICU doesn't have room for her yet. They promised a bed within the next two hours. So while she's here for mental status declines, I'd have a low threshold to intubate her. And if her blood pressure doesn't come up, then start norepinephrine. We'll go see her after sign out. So Mrs. S has urosepsis, she's hypotensive, and she's altered. Uh, I'll go on and reassess her mental status and I'll see how she responds to the IV fluids. Uh, she may need to be intubated and she may or may not require pressors. Uh, I'll call and uh, check in with the ICU for a bed. Are you worried at all that anything may be going on in her belly? That's a good question. So when I palpated her abdomen, she didn't really react and her urine's pretty convincing. But if she gets worse rather than better, then I'd uh, reconsider it. So we'll see her first after sign out. Yeah. Okay, so Mrs. Uh, C in room three, I don't really know what's going on with her yet, so she's gonna be a watcher. She's a 34-year-old non-pregnant female coming in with three days of right lower quadrant pain. The pain started off mild, but progressively got more severe. Here, she's pretty tender in the right lower quadrant, and on pelvic exam, she didn't have any cervical motion tenderness, but didn't really tolerate an, an exam of the right pelvic region, so much so that I couldn't really get a good exam of the ovary. She's has a UA that's pending, a CBC, and a BMP that are also pending. And I started off with uh, some analgesics and a pelvic ultrasound. So you're gonna need to follow up on the labs, you're gonna have to follow up on the results of the ultrasound and reassess her pain. Now if the ultrasound is negative for torsion, then I'd go ahead and get a CT looking for appendicitis. Obviously you'll have to reassess and readjust the plan if her condition changes. But either way, even if she has a negative workup, I'd still keep her for observation to see if she has progression of symptoms. So Mrs. C, there's concern for ovarian torsion. We're gonna to do an ultrasound to rule that out. If that's negative, we're gonna do a CT to rule out appendicitis. We're gonna keep her overnight either way. Um, and can we see her after sign out as well? Yeah, sure. So just to recap, uh, Mr. A uh, in room one has uh, an appy and he's going to the OR. Mrs. S uh, in room two is sick with urosepsis. She's hypotensive, she's altered. Um, she may need to be intubated and may or may not require pressors, and I'll call and check in with the ICU for a bed. Uh, we'll see her first after sign out. And Mrs. C uh, in room three has right lower quadrant pain. We're concerned for ovarian torsion. We'll do an ultrasound if that's negative. We'll do a CT to rule out appendicitis, and we'll go re-examine her together right now. Got it. Well, if that doesn't make Coach happy, then I'm not sure what will. All done here, Aditi. There you have it, folks, the eye pass in motion. Sure does make for a great handoff. And we're out of time. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Emergency Medicine Prime Time. Until next time, folks. Huh?